Today we're going to learn why yesterday you learned how to add chemical reactions together, the equations for those. Why did we learn how to add those together? And he starts talking about how this is a new look at Hess's law, which we talked about before in first year chemistry, and all about enthalpy. But if it's been a while since you took first year chemistry, you may not really remember what enthalpy is. So I want to go back and review that a little bit um, so that you have a clear picture in your head of why we're actually doing these, these things that we're doing with these equations. Enthalpy is a measure of a system's potential energy. Remember that potential energy is stored energy. So when you have um, chemicals, when you have bonds, you have stored energy within, within those particular molecules. If you have a change in enthalpy, then that is the, interchange, the energy change that accompanies either a physical change or a chemical change. Remember, a physical change is something that doesn't change the nature of um, the substance that you have. So it may be a change of state, um, whether you're uh, melting something, whether you're boiling something, it's still the same uh, compound or the same element, you're just changing its state. Uh, it may be a matter of mixing some things together. As long as there's no chemical reaction, you can make a mixture and it doesn't change the characteristics of what's in there. Um, or you can have a chemical change where you actually have things reacting together to form something else. So whenever you have some sort of a physical change or a chemical change, and there is a, there's going to be an energy change that accompanies that, that's considered a change in enthalpy. Enthalpy... Um, we abbreviate that, or the letter that stands for enthalpy is a capital H. And so a change in enthalpy, to indicate change, we use the Greek letter delta. Okay, so change in enthalpy. Now, whenever you calculate the change in something, you need to make sure that you take the final state minus the initial state, because that's going to calculate the change. If you flip those backwards, then you're going to have the sign backwards as well. Okay, now there, you also recall that when you have a change in enthalpy, you can have two different kinds of reactions, either exothermic or endothermic. An exothermic reaction is one that gives off heat. It feels hot. And so delta H is gonna be negative because um, the final state is less than what you had initially. So it feels hot and you've actually lost energy. Okay, an example of that um, that you saw in your first year course is when you mix yeast together with hydrogen peroxide. Uh, when you mix those two together, the container is going to feel very hot. Now, an endothermic reaction is just the opposite of that. There, your delta H is going to be positive, and that's a reaction that's going to feel cold because it's got to gain energy from the surroundings. So an example of that is if you mix baking soda and vinegar together. You do that, and then your reaction vessel is going to feel cold. Now, this potential energy that we're talking about is present in the chemical bonds. And so if I'm going to break a bond, that requires energy. So I have to absorb energy from the surroundings in order to break bonds. If I'm going to make a bond, it's going to release energy. Why does it do that? Because making a bond and sharing electrons allows the compound, allows the atoms within the compound to achieve an ideal electron configuration. So maybe they're um, obeying the octet rule for an example, and that's going to make the compound more stable, okay? So therefore, the change in enthalpy of a reaction is what I get when I subtract the energy that I get from making the bonds. I subtract from that the energy that it took to break the bonds. The way to write that mathematically is to say delta H equals, the capital sigma means the sum of, so when I add everything up. So it's the sum of the change in enthalpy of the products minus the sum of the change in enthalpy of the reactions, or of the reactants. Now this F stands for formation, the, the enthalpy of formation. Enthalpy of formation is the energy that it takes to actually form a compound, to put it together from its elements and to form a compound. So if I take all the heats of formation, all the enthalpies of formation of the products, and I subtract that from all the heats of formation of the reactants, that will give me the change in enthalpy for the reaction. Now, um, Hess's law 
which again, you learned in your first year course, says that enthalpy is a state function and it's independent of past. So what does that mean? Well, let's say that I'm trying to get from point X over here to point Y. Now, the quickest and easiest and most direct way to do that is to take that path right there, to take a straight line, okay? So we're gonna to refer to that as path A. However, I could also start at point X and I could go up this way and meander around this way and go over this way and come up back this way and still end up at Y, okay? I could still get from X to Y going along this path. The end result is the same, but I've taken a much longer, less direct path to get there. What Hess's law says is that it doesn't matter whether I take path A or path B, the end result is the same. I've still ended up at point Y, I started at X, I ended up at Y, the end result is the same no matter which path I take. Now, the author then tries to use an example to show you um, in chemical terms what he means by that, and I don't know if you had trouble following his argument or not, so I'm gonna try to show you. In example 1.4, which we did in the last video, um, we had ozone reacting with a chlorine atom, and we took that through two different steps, and we ended up with the net reaction of O3 plus O yielding 2O2. And then when we added those two reactions together, we canceled out the chlorine and the CLO on both sides to end up with this net reaction, okay? So we ended up same with this particular reaction at the end of example 1.4. Then on page eight, he shows you two more reactions. He says, I can also combine a free hydrogen atom with ozone to make an OH plus O2, and then I can take that OH and react it with a free oxygen atom to make H plus O2. When I do that, what you will see happen here is I can cross out the H's on both sides. I can cross out the OH's on both sides. And lo and behold, what do I end up with? I end up with O3 plus O yields two O2s. Okay, now if you notice, that's the same reaction as it was over here. So what, I'm, what that tells me is that I still ended up at point Y. I got the same net reaction in both cases, the same overall reaction in both cases, even though the path that I took to get there was different. Therefore, what that means is that the change in enthalpy for this reaction is going to match the change in enthalpy for this reaction, and it doesn't matter which path I took to get there, okay? So that is the background information for um, everything that we're doing with all of these um, equation manipulations that we're going to be doing in this section with Hess's Law. So let's work a couple of examples so that you can understand what we're doing. Um, hopefully um, that helped to enlighten you as to why we're doing what we're doing. And then the manipulations at this point then really become just a matter of algebra. It's really what it comes down to. All right, so let's look at example 1.5. And he says that we're reacting solid iron and chlorine gas together and getting a solid product of FeCl3. And so we have two steps that we're taking to get to this final product. So I have Fe plus Cl2 is going to yield FeCl2. And the delta H for that reaction is a negative 341.8 kilojoules, and then I take the FeCl2, and I add one half of a Cl2, and I get FeCl3, which is a solid, and that delta H is negative 57.7 kilojoules. Okay, so just like we did before, um, I know the reaction mechanism. These are the two steps that this reaction happens in. And now the difference is that I now also have these change in enthalpies. 
So if I add these two reactions together, what am I going to end up with? Well, if I do the same thing as I did before, and I can cancel this and I can cancel this on both sides of the equation, what I will end up with is my overall reaction. Now I do wanna jump in here and make one particular little comment. One is that if you're canceling things out, one thing that you wanna watch is that you're always canceling things in the same state. So for example, if you've got liquid water on one side of the equation that you're gonna to try to cancel it, you have to make sure you're canceling that with liquid water. Don't cancel that out with, um, with water vapor on the other side. They have to be in the same state because um, enthalpy re relies on the particular state of the compounds that we're talking about. So make sure when you cancel, you're always canceling the same state, okay? Now, when I add these two together, I end up with iron plus one plus one and a half is three halves CO2 yielding FeCl3. Then since I added the two equations together, I'm just gonna add the two enthalpies together and that's gonna give me a delta H of 399.5, okay? It's really not too hard, is it? That's the same thing I did before. The only difference in what I did here and what we did yesterday is that when I added them together, I just simply had to add these numbers together as well, all right? Um, he said, when he, when he said, you may be wondering about that fraction because we've never used fractions there before. And he's like, oh, just don't worry about that. Well, let me tell you why you don't have to worry about it because you can't have a molecule and a half of Cl2 that doesn't work. Um, it just, that, that it just doesn't exist. We always had whole numbers whenever we balanced equations before. When we're working enthalpy problems, what we're looking at vast majority of the time is an enthalpy of formation. And so really what this is saying is that the change in enthalpy for the formation of one mole of this is this particular amount of energy. And so uh, what you will most often see is that because I want a one over here, I may have fractions over here. And that's okay because I'm not talking about molecules in this, in this sense. I'm only referring in, to this equation in terms of moles. And I can easily have a fraction of a mole. I can have a part of a mole, although I cannot have a fraction of a molecule, okay? So that's why you don't have to worry about the fractions because when we're looking at the heats, we're looking at one mole of what is formed over here. And generally the reactions that he gives you, he's gonna ask you just for formation of one mole on the product side, okay? So this is when things are nice and they add up together easily, but sometimes the reactions that we get in the lab don't always work that way so well. So sometimes we end up with some reactions that we've got to manipulate in order to actually get what we're looking for. And that's where um, or example 1.6 takes us. So he gives us two reactions and says, now I want you to count the delta H for this, for this other reaction. So let's get these two initial reactions up here. We've got two manganese plus an O2 yields two MnO with a delta H of negative 770.4. And then I have two MnO2s. It's going to yield O2 plus 2 MnO, I think I've got the state there, and delta H equals 269.7. Now, those are the two reactions I have to work with. He's asking me to calculate the delta H for the formation reaction of manganese dioxide. If you look at that, um, you will see, like as I mentioned in the other example, I'm forming one mole of MnO2. So I have to manipulate these equations so that when I add them together, that final equation that I get is Mn plus O2 yields MnO2 because what I want is the number then that's going to go with that. Well, if I look at these 
equations just the way they are, that's not what I'm going to end up with. The MnO2 in this equation down here is on the left-hand side. And what I'm looking for is to have it on the right-hand side. So the first thing I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to take this second equation and I'm going to have to flip it backwards because that's the only equation that has MnO2 in it. And, it, and, the, and my final answer, it has to be on the right-hand side. So I've got to take it and flip it the other direction. Secondly, the other problem that I have with this equation is that this has a 2 in front of the MnO2. And the final answer that I want just has 1 MnO2. So in order to get that formation reaction, I'm going to have to take this, I'm going to have to flip it backwards, and I'm going to have to multiply it by half. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a little note over here to myself that I reversed it and then I multiplied it by half, okay? You don't have to do that, but sometimes if you make a mistake and you need to go back and check your work, it will be helpful for you to go, what was I doing there? How did I get that? And then if you have made a mistake, it's a little easier to find. So that's why I like to kind of write a little note to myself on the other side. So if I'm going to reverse this, that means I'm going to put this side first and I'm going to multiply it by half. So I'm going to have one half O2 plus MnO yields MnO2. Now, when I do that, when I reverse the reaction, this was positive. Now, if this was an endothermic reaction before, it's now going to become an exothermic reaction. So if I reverse the reaction, I have to change the sign. I've also multiplied the equation by half, so I have to take half of this as well. And when I do that, that's going to give me um, negative 134. 0.9 kilojoules, okay? I am keeping track of my significant figures here. So if you just divide that in half, you're gonna end up with, with two figures on that side, but I need to not go beyond um, the tenths place there, all right? So now I have my MnO2 on the right-hand side, which is what the problem asked for. So now I'm gonna have to add some, add this other equation to it so that I get rid of this MnO. I don't want the MnO because obviously I have to that's not in the formation reaction. The formation reaction has the manganese and the oxygen, but this species isn't in there, so I have to get rid of that. The nice thing about this top reaction that I haven't used yet is that the MnO is on the right-hand side, so it will cancel with this one. But if you notice, I only have one mole here, and I have two moles here. And so that means I have too much of this one. So I'm gonna to have to do the same thing to this equation. I'm gonna to have to multiply this equation by half also in order to get what I need so that it will cancel out. So if I take this, multiply everything through by half, that's gonna give me Mn plus O2 yields, I'm sorry, plus one half O2, because I'm multiplying it by half. It's gonna give me MnO in the solid form. And if I divide that in half, that's gonna give me a negative 385.2 kilojoules. So I just took this negative 770.4, divide it in half, got negative 385.2, all right? Now, if everything worked out right, everything should cancel out and give me that formation reaction that I was looking for. So if I start canceling things out here, the, um, and then O is going to cancel on both sides. And the um, that's all it's going to cancel. So then I'm going to have MN, which is solid. I've got a half a mole of O2 and another half a mole of O2, which gives me a whole mole of O2, which is one. And then that's going to yield MnO2 as a solid. And now I can just add these two equations together, which will give me a delta H of a negative 520.1 kilojoules, okay? So in this particular problem, we have really learned the two cardinal rules um, in order to work a Hess's law problem. Um, those two rules are that if I reverse an equation, I have to change the sign on the delta H. And if I multiply through by a number to change the coefficients, I have to multiply the delta H by that same number. 
Okay, so those are the two rules for manipulating equations in a Hess's Law uh, problem. Okay, um, the other problem is example 1.7, and we will go ahead and work that one real quick, uh, just in case you didn't understand it. It was, it's the same type of problem. So what you might want to do is before I work it out, if, um, if you saw it before and you didn't get it, if you want to go cover up the answer and see if you can work it on your own now, that would be good. If not, I'll show you how to work it. Again, we are looking for a formation reaction, which means I'm going to take all of the individual elements and get them to add together to form a specific product. So I'm starting out with these two equations. one's positive and then I have this one one half whoops one half CNS is solid well if I could copy it correctly it would help okay so those are the two equations I have to work with if I am looking for the formation reaction, what that means is I'm going to, for the formation reaction for zinc sulfate, that means I need to add together zinc plus sulfur plus oxygen on the left-hand side in order to come up with zinc sulfate on the right-hand side. So with what I have here, what is going to give me that particular reaction? Well, if I'm trying to form ZnSO4 on the right and I'm, I want a 1 in front of it, um, I'm going to have to multiply this whole equation through by 2 because I don't want just a half a mole. I want a whole mole over here. It's, it's, it's an enthalpy of formation, so I'm trying to form one mole. So I'm going to multiply this equation through by 2. So that's going to give me ZnS plus... Um, 2O2 yields ZnSO4, and that's going to give me a delta H of um, negative 776.8 kilojoules. Take this number, multiply it through by 2, okay? So ZnSO4 is on the right-hand side, and I now have a 1 in front of it just like I needed to. However, for a formation reaction, I don't want this Z and S in here. That's not going to help me out because I, that's not even in the formation reaction. So I need to get rid of that. I'm going to have to cancel that out. And this equation also has Z and S, but it's on the same side. So if I'm going to want to cancel this out, I'm going to have to flip it. The other way to think about it is formations reaction is where, where I'm adding all the elements together. I have the O2. I need the zinc and the sulfur separate. I have that in this equation, but they're on the wrong side. So I need to take this reaction and I need to reverse it. So when I reverse it, I'm going to have zinc uh, plus sulfur, and that's going to yield um, zinc sulfide. And since I reversed it, that means I also need to change the sign on this. Like that. And you'll notice, again, once I am getting my equations to the point where I'm going to add them together, I'm trying to keep my arrows lined up. All right. Now, if everything worked out right, I should be able to cancel things out and have the formation reaction. Um, so the ZNS down here is going to cancel with the ZNS up here. And then what I end up with is the zinc plus the sulfur plus two moles of oxygen and that will give me one mole of zinc sulfate. Okay, so that all worked out well. And then now all I have to do is add those two numbers together and that's going to give me uh, a negative 982.8 kilojoules. Okay, so that is example 1.7. 
Um, again, all of these reactions are for formation reactions. Um, one of your problems also mentions a complete combustion reaction. And just to trigger your memory, a complete combustion reaction is when you react a hydrocarbon with oxygen and your two products are carbon dioxide and water. So when you're trying to make that reaction, just recall that you're gonna to have to react it with oxygen on the left. And then when you get finished, your products are gonna be carbon dioxide, not carbon monoxide, but carbon dioxide and water. So when you get to that problem, you'll know what to do with that.